Okay, we're going to talk about roots of administration. Now, if you remember back to VET 12012 or VET 1200, whichever one you were in, um, we did talk about this. Um, I believe it was chapter 19 of your uh, McKernan's book. Um, and if you want, you can go back to uh, that chapter in my um, uh, YouTube channel for um, VET 1202. And you can take a look at those videos as well if you need some, some refresher. So let's just review. So there are a lot of factors to consider when we're determining the proper route of a drug administration. If a drug is given the wrong route of administration, it could be toxic or deadly. So here are some factors. Speed of onset, which route um, is, is more rapid, which one is slower? Do we want more rapid effect or do we want a slower effect? How do we want our duration of action? How long do we want it to act in the body? Um, Sub-Q sub duration of action is going to be longer than IV um, duration of action. Um, site of administration on the patient's body. Some drugs may be formulated to reach certain areas of the body, so we may need to uh, give it a certain way. Also, the drug properties. What's its solubility? Is it highly lipid soluble? Is it highly water soluble? And its ionization property. Is it non-ionized or is it um, po positively or negatively, negatively charged? Also, the acid-base status. Why does this matter? Um, the acid-base status of the animal Remember, pH is going to uh, change the way that this, that uh, in the blood is going to change the way that drugs are uh, transported through the body. We also need to consider the potential side effects and reactions. What forms are available? Sometimes we don't have forms that are available in, in a liquid or in a capsule. Also, the patient's behavior. If we have a cat that is difficult to pill, how are we going to get them the medication? Um, client's ability. Sometimes the patient's going to tolerate the, the treatment, but the client cannot physically um, pill the cat or can't financially provide a certain medication. Oral administration is PO. It's also peros or by mouth. Okay? It's most commonly used route of administration in veterinary medicine. It does have the slowest onset to action. The absorption into the bloodstream may be incomplete. So when we talk about bioavailability, we're going to be lower on the percentage side. Um, some problems that we might see with it would be vomiting and diarrhea. And of course, if the animal is already having vomiting or diarrhea, that's going to change whether the, the drug is absorbed completely or not. Larger volume is typically needed versus IV. Um, again, it's because of the bioavailability um, of the drug. Generally, it's considered the safest route, but in some cases can induce vomiting if it's ingested. Um, if we do have an uh, animal that uh, eat, that takes too much of it, we can give activated charcoal. Um, lower peak blood levels will are um, due to slower absorption with Peros. Parenteral refers to IV, IM, or sub-Q injection. Um, Solutions need to be checked carefully and thoroughly. We want to make sure that this that's stored correctly because if you don't store it correctly, you could change what's the, the chemical that's in the solution. We want to make sure we're not exposing it to temperature extremes and we've identified the expiration date. We do not want to use it IV if we can see anything in the solution. If it doesn't look completely clear, um, unless it's propofol, then it has a precipitate in it. In that case, we want to use it sub-Q or IM only. So dis differences, advantages, disadvantages. It, it really depends on the animal um, and what we're looking to, to treat. Um, so we see all of these different pills. Um, you know, some of these are huge that be difficult to give. Um, and then, you know, how are we dispensing it? Um, can we give it to an, uh, can the, the owner give it to the animal safely? IV has the fastest onset. Um, it's the highest initial blood levels of the of um, all of the roots. Um, it is shortest duration of action, so it gets in there quickly, but it also leaves quickly. We do have increased risks of adverse reactions, but it is really good for emergency medications, and it's great for painful drugs um, because when we give it IV, um, the only thing that's painful when we put something in IV is when we put it uh, through the uh, skin and muscle and into the vessel. Uh, there's no nerve endings inside the vessel itself. 
IM drugs, um, we need to limit the amount of IM medication to three to five millimeters, milliliters in a small patient. So you don't want to give a large amount of IM. Just think of those muscle fibers stretching. In a large animal, we can give up to 10 mils in one injection site. To move and to change the injection site, you don't need to take the needle completely out of the skin. You can just take it out of that point in the muscle, put it in a different point in the muscle, just change the angle a little bit, and you can administer more. If you take it completely out of the skin, you're going to put it through another uh, place in the skin and, and give it um, uh, through another set of nerve endings, so it can be even more painful. The injection can be pa painful based on volume and location, so be careful of um, ketamine and some other things. Um, it does have slower onset than IV, and we always want to pull back to make sure we're not in the vein because a lot of these drugs we're giving IM, we're doing it because we cannot give it IV. So we always want to aspirate on that plunger, make sure there's no blood in there. Subcutaneous is slower onset than IM, longer duration. Some implants can last weeks to years. We want to limit the volume based on species, body condition, and space. Um, so um, if we can give uh, more uh, fluids because we have more space under the skin like a cat versus if we have less space under the skin like a bird, we may have to give limit, limit the volume we can give. If we give too much subcutaneously, we can damage the tissue. So we do need to be careful how much we give. Intradermal injections are not done very frequently. This is an example of when we would give intradermal injections, and this is for an allergic reaction test. So allergy testing, uh, also in tuberculosis testing for cattle. Um, but there are very, because it's not absorbed into the body, um, we don't get a good reaction. Intraarticular um, injections would be made directly into the joint cavity. We might use anti-inflammatory drugs uh, to do this, but we absolutely need sterile prep and aseptic technique. Why is that? Because if we inject anything in with our medication, like um, something that's on the skin surface, that is a closed um, uh, part of the body and it doesn't receive a lot of um, blood flow and so we're not going to be able to treat that very easily. It will, it will grow a, a nice um, bacterial culture in there. Intracardiac, we don't do much intracardiacly uh, because it is damaging to the heart. And um, if we do, we want to feel where the heart is, the fourth intercostal space, or just where you feel the heart beating um, the, the most. We can do it for emergency drugs or for euthanasia. Um, and I'm going to um, reserve it if we're going to euthanize um, a very compromised pet. I can't get an IV um, uh, on an, a vessel on or pocket pet or wildlife. And I definitely don't want to do that around the, the owner. That's a difficult thing to see. Intraperitoneally or IP, onset and duration will vary just depend on where you put it. Um, and uh, if there is um, uh, ab uh, ab a lot of abdominal fluid, to, it dilutes the effect. If there's not a lot of blood flow to the area, it's not going to absorb very quickly. In general, it can absorb pretty quickly, um, especially with pocket pets. Uh, they have a um, you know, pretty good surface area in there compared to their size, uh, so it can get in pretty quickly. It does cause organ trauma if you poke in the wrong spot, so we will teach you where the right spot is. If you think about the anatomy of the um, abdomen, um, you will realize that in the right lower quadrant, there aren't a lot of um, uh, there aren't a lot of organs there, so that's where we do it. Um, so we want to be careful not to poke the wrong thing. Uh, we do have to be careful when we're putting medication in there, um, understand that any irritation or trauma that you do cause will cause adhesions or scar tissue to form, um, so you want to be careful not to do it too often. Um, but it is something we'll do to euthanize pocket pets if necessary. Intramedullary is an injection directly into the bone marrow, usually through the humerus or femur, so the really big um, uh, bones. Useful in, it's also called intraosseous. Uh, it's useful in pediatrics, um, but you do need sterile prep for that as well.
Epidurals, uh, spinal anesthesia, um, or in the spinal roots uh, for local blocks in cattle. Um, I do have a YouTube video for, here for you to watch. Um, and it is unavailable. I believe that it might be available if you copy and paste that link, which I, I'm not going to take the time to do at this moment. Okay, um, but if you copy and paste that link, you should be able to see a spinal anesthesia or, or basically how you do it. It's actually really easy to do. We do want to do sterile prep for this as well, um, but it's actually really easy to find where you do it and how to inject it. Inhalants would be administered via nebulizer or vaporizer, um, provides rapid blood levels and requires careful monitoring, so we do want to watch them very closely. Topical um, is very common. It's applied to skin or mucous membranes. Um, in this, with the skin, we have a slow absorption, usually only a local effect, um, but steroids are different. They have a systemic effect. DMSO is, a, a, is an ointment or oil that helps to increase the absorption of dimethyl sulfoxide and has an anti-inflammatory effect. So mucous membranes are very vascular, and so we will get a much quicker effect uh, with a topical solution there. So sublingual, uh, get absorption across the lingual vein. Um, we use Dopram as a respiratory stimulant this way. Gingival, we might give glucose syrups or caro syrups if we have a hypoglycemic event. Rectally, um, we have uh, quick absorption like Valium. Uterus, uh, using the uterus, the uh, vagina, or the intramammary um, mucous membranes is possible. Um, ophthalmic, we have conjunctiva, is very vascular, and then the otic uh, mucous membranes as well. Indications are, are proved uses, the studied uses of the drug, tested uses of the drug, um, and use in specific species. Um, antibiotics for bacterial infections, aspirin is anti-inflammatory, barbiturate is anesthesia induction, um, Batril, for instance, is indicated in a respiratory infection in an adult dog, but it's contraindicated in a res for a respiratory infection in a six-month-old dog. So that's the indication is respiratory infection, but contraindication is respiratory infection in a small dog or younger dog that's growth plates are not um, completely uh, ossified um, because it actually will close those growth plates early. So here's contraindication, so inadvisability of using a medication or a drug. So a patient uh, that is sensitive to a certain antibiotic, we would that would be contraindicated. Or um, if we have an animal that ha has a platelet disease where it's not making enough platelets, we would not want to give that animal aspirin because it will further um, cause further problems. Adverse reactions is any undesirable response to a drug that can be mild to life-threatening. Any animal can have a reaction to any drug. And adverse reactions are side effects. So why? Why do we see adverse reactions? Um, it can have something to do with the quality of the drug, the route of administration, the dose of administration, or a reaction to the carrier or vehicle. Some signs can be just dermatitis, so just inflammation of the skin, some shock or even death, GI upsets, abortion, depression or hyperactivity, and organ failure. Extra label use. So like I said, drugs aren't often made just for animals. Um, and, and when we do make drugs for animals, not a lot of um, money is put into testing for lots of different species. So sometimes we need to take drugs that are labeled for, say, a, ca a cow and use it in a cat. But if we do that, we need to take responsibility for the outcome. Okay, so we need to know about the drug in order to make sure that it's going to be safe for this animal. So if we use a drug in a different species than it's indicated, or we use a drug at a different dosage or frequency than it's been um, tested for, or we use a medication to treat for a different indication. So we're using medication that's labeled to treat a urinary tract infection, and now we're treating a respiratory infection. Or we use something that is um, uh, for a different route of administration. We're using a drug that is typically used um, as an injection orally um, uh, for a pet or we're using a drug in a new dosage form. So this is an example. Ivermectin is used for heartworm prevention, um, and injectable ivermectin is used to treat uh, intestinal parasites for cattle. 
but we also use ivermectin to treat Demodex infection in dogs or infestation in dogs, and we will use the Ivomec, the injectable Ivomec, and compound it um, or use it straight as an oral solution. Or we use this ivermectin in mineral oil, compound it in mineral oil to treat um, ear mites in cats. Now, those are all extra label or off label uses, and in order to do that, we need to take responsibility and we should. Um, also uh, give that information to the client and let them know that it is extra label. There are the, these drugs that are prohibited for extra label use in all food producing animals and I won't, we said this in the last ex lecture and I went through these and you should know some some of these basics, um, chloramphenicol, diethylstilbestrol, uh, fluoroquinolone, sulfa drugs in lactating animals, um, phenylbutazone in um, producing um, cattle. So some examples of parenteral medications, how we give them. We said single dose vial, multi-dose vial, um, ampule. This is an, what an ampulla looks like. So this is an ampule and then um, a bag of fluids. So you need to know what syringe when you're giving an injection, you need to know your syringes, right? So this is a, a tuberculin syringe. It's a one cc syringe. This is a, an insulin syringe. This is one type of insulin syringe. This is a 100 U100 syringe. It goes with U100 insulin. So you have to match the insulin syringe to the type of insulin because they, the units are different for each in type of insulin. Luralox syringes. Um, lock your needle in, and these are slip tip syringes, so you can get the needle off more easily. Eccentric uh, tip syringes have the, sur uh, the tip off to the side. This can be helpful in uh, times when, we, um, uh, when we're um, putting something into a catheter uh, and we don't want the you know, whole half of that syringe um, on the animal. We just want a part of the syringe on the animal. A catheter tip is a syringe that uh, attaches to a, like a red rubber catheter. You do need to know the difference between these because if you're ordering syringes for your practice, you need to know what you're ordering. You need to know how to read syringes as well. So I don't know if you can see these blue lines here, but if this is a 3cc syringe, you need to know that each one of these lines means a tenth of a, a mil. So this would be 1.4 mils. This would be 2.2 five mils. But if you're looking at a tuberculin syringe, each one of these is 0 0.01 of a mil. So this would be 0.25 mls. This would be 0.5 mls. Here is a unit. So this would be 59 units. This is uh, 50 units. So this would be uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 units. Okay. This is um, a 12 milliliter syringe. So these are in 10th um, or I'm sorry, 0.2 increments. These little lines are 0.2 increments, so 6.2, 6.4, 6.6, 6.8. And with a larger syringe, they're going to be in uh, one milliliter um, uh, in increments. So this would be 10, 11, 12, 13 mils. So you need to be able to read each one very carefully and don't get it mixed up between the three mil syringe and the tuberculin syringe. That's a common problem. Needles. You need to know when you're ordering needles or using needles what size gauge it is. The smaller the, the, the smaller the number, the bigger the needle, the wider the needle. What type is it? Um, what length is it as well? So look at the differences between those. Remember your five rights to administration, right patient, right drug, label three, check the label three times, right dose, right route, right time and frequency. When we're labeling and dispensing, um, you're gonna need to know some common abbreviations. So SID, we use only in, in veterinary medicine. It means once a day, single, single ingestion daily, okay? Um, this is uh, in human medicine. When you write a human prescription, you're calling into a human pharmacy, you need to use the abbreviation QD, which Q means every, every day or daily. Okay. Um, BID means twice daily. TID means three times daily. 
QID means four times daily. PRN means give as needed. Q means every, so we're going to give it every day or every four hours. Paros means by mouth. So whether you give medications in the hospital, send them home with a patient, this data has to be recorded in the medical record and you need to sign or initial this documentation. So for example, I've got a couple of examples here. On 11-4-2020 at 9.30, we've got this patient, uh, the bright, alert, responsive, and hydrated temp in the TPR, and now we're giving 250 milligrams amoxicillin PO, flushed IV catheter with 3 mils saline, continued IVS LRS at 15 GTT drops per minute, um, and I've signed it, okay? And then at 4.30, we've still got a bright alert patient. Their temperature's a little bit lower. Um, pulse is a little higher. They're panting. Um, we've replaced the catheter. Leg is bandaged. Release the owner with, uh, release to the owner with amoxicillin, 250 milligram tablet, one tablet, PO, BID, times 10 days, number 20. So we're giving it um, one twice a day for tw 10 days. That's 20 given with food. So I put all the information there in uh, with the abbreviations that I understand. When I dispense this medication, I'm going to have to spell it out for the client a little bit differently. And we do have um, very specific information um, by law that we have to conclude on the medication label. Um, so about the pe people or pet, we have the facility name, address, and phone number. So right here, facility name, address, phone number. We have the veterinarian's name, Sam Razor. With the client's name and address. So in this case, uh, we've got Coco um, uh, Cox, so Susan Cox. Um, and we, um, their address is not always on here, but as long as we have the ability to pull their address, um, we will be able to pull that address uh, up from the computer. Um, and then the patient's name and species. So canine, beagle, chihuahua, russell, uh, mutt, mixed breed, um, the name of the drug, prednisone, strength of the drug, 10 milligrams, quantity dispensed, 15 tablets, instructions to the client about how to administer it. So amount given. So take one tablet orally every six hours for five days, follow up in 10 days. Um, manner in which to administer it, how often to administer it, the duration of administration, number of refills permitted, expiration date of the drug dispensed, and then the statement for veterinary use only and keep out of reach of children is optional. So here's our refills. Okay. Writing prescriptions. If an animal requires medication to be dispensed by an outside pharmacy or human or otherwise, it must have a prescription to obtain the medication because we have that veterinarian patient client relationship or veterinary client patient relationship. Um, but your technician is often the one um, calling that in. So unless we have that intact, we cannot do that. Um, writing it down um, or calling it in is easier than writing labels. We can give the information to the pharmacist um, who needs to fill the prescription and write the label. Um, for, you see that on the previous slide. These are typical abbreviations. If it's controlled substance, you're going to need the veterinarian's DEA license number, which is a very uh, secret uh, thing. It's a very controlled thing. If it's a controlled substance, then often refills are zero. If we are ordering controlled substances, it has to be done under a DEA licensed veterinarian, and we have to track those from ordering through disposal and dispensing. Category two substances have to have special forms um, to fill out, that we fill out in order to obtain. We log all incoming controlled substances, label all bottles, um, store in a locked safe bolted to the surface, lock behind a locked cabinet and a locked door. Um, and then we dispense, we log all that dispense medication typically by 0.01 mils or a quarter of a tablet, so to a very small degree. Um, we need to have the date, patient animal name, address, the species, and the initials of that person that's administering the dispense or dispensing. And if we have the initials versus signing it, we have to have a master signature list so we can recognize those initials. Um, when we log it out, we write that out, we then have to have a previous balance, what it was before you dispensed it, the amount you dispensed, and then you have a new balance, you keep a running total. If you have any questions about how to fill out a log, how to dispense, how to label things, uh, please bring those to class. We may try to practice a couple of those while we're in class.